Hi, everybody. Looks like folks are starting to come in, Kathy and Dale. Hi. How are you? I'm fine. How are things there? Good. I was getting ready to send you a note, Kathy, you and Dean, about um, the next step for the. Yeah, here's the next step. <laughs> yeah. I was going to have, I, I was going to make a meeting for you all early next week to talk about um, doing some digitization of the unit strata and was going to bring um, Hannah and Taylor in on that. Okay. So I'll be in, I'll be in touch shortly. Just been a, a busy couple of weeks. So. Oh, that's okay. Uh, this is, I didn't go into withdrawal. <laughs> oh, no, I don't want you to go into withdrawal, Kathy. So. I, I actually, you know, kind of was able to handle it like an adult. <laughs> oh. But uh, no, no, my calendar's wide open, so. <laughs> cool, that's great. <laughs> yes. Hi, Wendy. How are you doing? Pretty good. I'm going to take my video off because I'm going to be eating lunch. I'm going to actually eat lunch during the lunchtime seminar. So. That sounds good. I, Wendy, I, I was also going to, I'm going to schedule a, um, a, a Zoom session for, for, for you and some of the other participants in August. Okay, to good. To go over just what the program will be. So it's um, kind of the fun part about, um, about Zoom. Everybody's used to Zoom. We can do these kind of live meetings and it's not right. a deal which is great we kind of get to know each other before we get there so that's great yeah yeah that is, that is definitely another point so people can make connections so right. okay well i will turn on back i'll video back in once i finish my lunch all right sounds good so hi dean how are you doing hey Taylor. good how are you how's everybody good. down there it, the weather isn't bad it rained a lot uh yesterday morning oh yeah it, by the by 10 o'clock the sun was out so yeah i uh um same here uh, um more or less kathy i'm gonna i'm gonna be sending you all an email later on today about the volunteering and setting up a meeting okay so and what the next step on that would be so all have right. exciting plans it's the other hey sarah lee how are you so and laura hello and Dale, looks like you're hooking up to audio. Good to see you. Or good to see your name there. <laughs> well, I think I might have some noise in the background. They just took down a, a big pine tree in my yard. And uh, um, the actually, I've got a video. I'll, I'll um, let me see if I can share screens for a, sh a second. Share and let's see. Um, here's the video of it coming down. <laughs> so that that was just uh, that was just well. this morning. <laughs> so I'm I'm gonna have a um. Not a lot of pickup. They're they're chipping most of it, but uh, I'm gonna have to gonna play with a block and pulley and my jeep to move the logs down to where a friend of mine can get them with his grapple hook and haul them away for me. And the company wanted eight hundred dollars to haul the tree away, and I was like, um, I will play with some ropes and my jeep to get that done. So, oh, Will, how are you? Good to see you, Will. And Suzanne, nice to have you join us. So, Will, I'm going to be, um, I'll be stop sharing screens for a second. Will, I'll be recording this if you want to send it to any of your um, students. Uh, glad you're able to join on, on with this. So, we'll, we'll um, give folks a few more minutes to, to hop on here. Um, but I was, uh, I wanted to show you all what we've been working on with the like kind of the end product for not the, the final end product but toward getting toward the product for the IMLS grant and the IMLS grant is as a lot of you all know is the uh, pro the digitization project for the mansion restoration work and we and how's my sound is the interference with the the chipper that bad it's good Okay, good deal. If you if I can't if you can't hear at some point, just give me a shout out. Um, but we're basically digitizing the all of the mansion restoration 
And for the archaeology department, a big part of that is digitizing all our, all our um, records. And these are excavation records that would go from about 2002 through about 2008. And so they span, a, you know, many, a, several excavation seasons and two different type of sets of record keeping. So um, what's great about the IMLS grant is we actually have money to do the digitization process that we've been looking to do for a long time. And being a grant, of course, we're obligated to get it done, which is nice. So it, it's really kind of forcing us to really um, uh, find a system and run with it. And uh, for those of y'all that are you know, coming out for an excavation, you'll this, this fall and later on in the spring, you'll see the direct results of that in the field because as Terry has talked to you all about before, we're going digital in the field work as well, where we're digitally recording all of the excavation information so that you know in the future, we don't have to do this digitization again. So, um, but what's exciting about the IMLS grant is we're, one, one big, one real emphasis on the IMLS grant is to bring all this stuff public. What we want to do is make all this data available online for, you know, the general, uh, general public, you know, everybody from other archaeologists to our expedition members, to community members, to descendants, and to the visiting public as well. Um, and so what we're looking to do is, you know, bring in all the scientific data that we've gathered through the years, but then also curate stories for, that we've been able to develop from those stories that either led to different parts of the restoration or different interpretations of the house, especially for us with archeology span and the, uh, the cellars under the portico. So I'm gonna show you the model and we'll go ahead and jump into this right now. Um, I will go ahead and we're um, recording. I'll go ahead and share screens here. So sharing screens. This is the, um, the digital model of the main house here. This is, uh, uh, this is all in Arc Pro. And the house, the really detailed model of the house, this has been taken from um, uh, 3DS Max. And the, the folks from the University of Arkansas, Angie Payne, has brought this into, um, into GIS, into Arc Pro, which allows us to really to begin to tie it to our data. So we're, we're still, we still have, Angie still has some work to do, like the, the model itself we need to tie to the actual landscape. The, um, the, the DEM or the digital elevation map that I've got for the property is, if you'll notice over here, you've got 3D layers and then you've got 2D layers. I have not tied the dim to the um, to the land to the three D layers yet because of the, some of the problems with getting the main house settled. So Angie still has some work to do on getting the final registration, you know, basically georeferencing for the main house done. But what we've been able to do is bring the model that Angie's provided us into the property as a whole. So this is if we go north here. This is all the property right here, all 2,700 acres. Here's Route 20 coming along here. The main house is here. Visitor center's over here. And you know, we've got you know, all of our data that we can bring in from metal detector survey data to excavations that we've done over, you know, for example, at the home farm with the, uh, with the this is the area where the field slave quarters are loca located. So this is, a shot of these excavations right here. And this is um, referencing these, these buildings. The, like when you click on these buildings, you can bring up all this information about the site. So, so this is, I mean, if, if you all have ever, you know, played with Google Maps, where you can click on a, um, on a, on a location uh, for like a restaurant and you click on it and photos come up and the website comes up, that's basically a GIS. And uh, with, the, with the GIS map, what's nice about this is we've got control over what data we can bring in. So we can bring in, for example, all of our excavation unit records for the, the main house. And in this case, like in the South Yard, um, uh, several of you, especially Kathy and Dean, remember 
digitizing all the unit records from the um, from the um, uh, from the uh, the East Smokehouse, and so we can go and um, we can go and pull up all the excavation records from this unit, unit two 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 zero, and this has this is one PDF that has everything in one place. You know, all the strata that were found, all the strat cards, the whole. Not, the, there's about probably thirty pages of information here, and with GIS, you know, once you get it digital and once you have the have the records named you can tie it to individual polygons, which is incredibly handy. So really the big work now is to get all this data in. And this is what um, the IMLS grant is allowing us to do for one of our most important sets of data, which is the data attached to the main house. Um, and uh, see a couple more people have come on, uh, including uh, Angie. Hi Angie, well, I was just giving you a big shout out for all the work you did on the, uh, the main house model. This is, uh, we're been having a lot of fun uh, uh, working with what you've created. And so, um, and Angie, if there's anything you wanna add, go ahead, feel free to, um, to, to break in here. I was gonna start taking the roof off the main house and things that Jen Glass would not want us to do uh, live, so. Um, awesome. But so, so for what Angie has been able to do is, and what's really quite exceptional for GIS, I mean, usually when you think of GIS, you think of this kind of 2D mapping where, you know, you can see, uh, you know, the polygons for the units, you can see, you know, the polygons for, and polygons are basically these shapes right here, which are all the information, in this case, attached to buildings. But what Angie is really revolutionizing with, with, G with ARC, use of ARC Pro is bringing in these really complicated models that have all these details from this 3D rendering program, called, which is a CAD program called 3DS Max. And so for instance, not only was Angie able to bring in the model, the exterior of the main house, but if we turn off the roof of the main house, you can see here's the second floor. Oh, oh here's the uh, second floor right here. So the second floor, if we come over here, you can see, you know, there's details of everything from, you know, the, the hearths themselves. So in this area right here in the, um, in the uh, room that's off the uh, rear terrace right here, you've got this wonderful detail, some, some of the photos that Angie was able to bring in of this hearth. The floors are just, you know, these, these uh, pine floors are just absolutely uh, gorgeous. And, but what's most important about this is this is a GIS tool, meaning that you can click on any of these objects and bring up information. So for example, in John Payne Todd's room, and this is the room that where John Payne Todd, according to documents, uh, resided. Here's his wallpaper with the, uh, the bees on it. And when you click on this wall right here, you can see the information comes up. This is a, you know, the, an exterior wall. Uh, we need to, you know, this is what Jen's going to be doing with one of her staff is filling out all the information, what room number it is, the element number for the wall, you know, for example, so for this window right here, this is, I've just got this labeled as a window, but once she attaches the element number and then she digits, she has, takes all these digital assets, like all the investigations that went into restoring this window, there's, you know, there's, mountains of documents. If you go to um, some of our online data, you know, there, there is just, you know, pages and pages and, and thousands of photos of all the investigations that we did. So for example, this is the, uh, the investigations into the, into the hearth in the uh, drawing room. And right now, you know, it's a little bit difficult to locate these photos. In fact, in a lot of cases, it's absolutely impossible. But with this digital model, you know, for example, so if we go to the drawing room next, we'll turn off the second floor, and here's here's the drawing room right here. So this the hearth right here, you can see um, Angie. I had not seen this yet, Angie. This is beautiful. Angie was able to from the CAD files bring in the actual photos of this this hearth that we found in the cellar. And then when you go to these investigation records and with, you know, with the photos, 
there's all this documentation that we get of this, uh, this hearthstone. So what we're gonna be able to do is tie all these records to, for example, this chimney hearth. And so when you click on this chimney hearth, we can, you know, you can either go into the base records and have, you know, this index of hundreds of photos and drawings that are attached to this, or what Jen is going to be able to, Jen's going to be able to do is curate a story of either, you know, Ray Canetti doing the reconstruction of the, uh, the fireplace surround with this um, uh, egg and dart um, uh, molding. Um, and so that one is all of, you know, these photos right here where he did you know, the investigation to the hearthstone, but then also you know, the evidence that was left of, that, um, of, the, uh, of the original um, sandstone fireplace around behind this early 20th, late 19th century brick. So essentially what this model is gonna do is allow us to index all of these records, you know, everything from staircases to, to um, fireplace surrounds to walls, all this stuff is going to be organized in this model. And then the model will be online and will allow for online exploration of all these spaces. So it'll make it, you know, make the, um, make this data a lot more accessible um, to, to, the, uh, to the public. So we've began, Hannah and Taylor um, here in archaeology, uh, they're part of the archaeology staff. They, this winter and spring, they started to digitize all of the records that we have for the main house cellar. And so, in the, and this is, a, a lot of these records are records that um, uh, uh, Dean and Kathy, you're very familiar with, you went through and you know, relabeled these photos so they have their names. So for example, this is the, this is the opening surface for MT975, and if you look up here, this file name right here, mt975.o.ph is photo, for the opening photo. That's tied to this record, which is, um, well, I've lost what unit that was, but it's tied into the, uh, um, what unit number uh, it's associated with. And there's a lot of, lot of different layers to click through here. But each of these squares right here has a unit number, and that's what ties all these rec records physically to one location. And you know, right now, I, I th this is um, the this uh, GIS map has everything but the kitchen sink in it right now. I mean, this this has all the the feature. This has all the layers, including the units themselves, every single strata that's been digitized. So all these have or most of these have it accompanying uh, photos that are associated with the excavations. But then there, there are also special areas, like, so like the features that we excavated, for example, this is one of the subfloor pits that we excavated right here. And this subfloor pit, this has the records, you know, with the, um, the opening photo, this is one of these subfloor pits we found in the cellar where the enslaved community kept hearth ash. And with the, the records online, you can just stroll through, for example, like the profile right here with this, this um, animal, this, uh, this uh, limb bone sticking out of the profile. You can also see the drawn profiles. I think this next one, yeah, this is a drawn profile right here. This was, one isn't a very exciting drawn profile, but this is this drawn profile bisect of the, uh, the feature that we've got. So with all this, so for, there's a, better one of these, let's see, the subfloor pit right here has some nice photography. This is a, a deeper subfloor pit we found in the 1765 cellar. And the um, profile here, there's a photo of the profile when we bisected it. But then also, this is the plan view drawing along with the profile itself. So what this allows us to do is basically index all this stuff to a map so that you can find it by location but then also you can sort out you know for example all these features that are in yellow right here the, the these guys right here these are let me turn off the den these these and the um let's see the stratum form all these that are in yellow here these are all subfloor pits so I, um, 
filtered the features for, for those features that are, are on. I'm, I'm muting you, Virginia, because you're getting feedback between your two lines. Um, I, what I've done is I filtered the features out in this layer just for the subfloor pits. And that's what, you know, for a story map that we create that would talk about how slaves used the, the, their work areas for, in some cases, personal storage, we could create, uh, you know, a special um, uh, uh, story map that focuses on those and then the viewer could go through and click on these online and look at all the different, you know, subfloor pits that we located. And so, and I think a number of y'all have seen the story maps we've created. Uh, Terry did some great ones for the shovel test pits with the dashboard that he and Chris worked on. Um, I've done one for the Eastwoods that, you know, you can um, create basically a website with text and images but then bring in the maps and then people can go in and actually explore the data. So, um, so we're, you know, the, the prospect of having all this data online is, is super exciting for us. And what we're, um, what we're looking to do is to bring not just the main house data into this system, but then a lot of the other data and begin representing the archaeology in the same way we've got the house with what Angie's helped us on with having the house represented in a um, in a way that's recognizable instead of just a polygon it's you know actually a 3d version of the house that you know has some real dynamic aspects you can you know peek in the windows here just it's just it makes it you know it's interesting in terms of being a space that can be explored but then you can also you know, pull in records and uh, um, look at some of the, the details, like every single column, we'll be able to bring in records on that. One, one other aspect of what Angie's helping us on with this model is if, let me see, if I turn off the, um, the exterior here, um, and I'm gonna turn off the, um, uh, the roof. Yeah, here we go. And what Angie's also helped us on, this is, makes the house look absolutely uh, like a turtle without its shell. This is just all the ex interior space revealed. But what Angie's also helping us on is how to render our units in space. So this, uh, this is literally in space. I, when you turn off the uh, the surface um, in, in Arc Pro, it makes it look like you're in outer space floating. But this, in, in this map, what we've got is a set of the records from one of our excavation blocks under the portico. And here you can see, you know, here's the features as they would be represented in 2D. So for example, these are these utility trenches that were cut through in the 20th century. But what, what Angie's allowing us to do is bring in the 3D representations of the profiles in this as well. So you can actually see these, these wall profiles in, uh, in relationship to the ground. And so this is something that, um, you know, we're excited about not only for um, the, uh, you know, representing what a unit looks like, but then also, and the, the zoom on this gets a little wonky, when you're this close in in Arc Pro. But the same way we can represent one of these surfaces here, like with the units, with the unit walls and the, um, and the, uh, the floor spaces, we can take this same sort of, you know, taking these, these are like this wall right here is a JPEG of the, um, of the wall profile that we digit digitized in AutoCAD. And then it's scaled in a program called SketchUp to fit within the block of these six units right here. So these block of six by six units right here, what Angie did is, you know, I sent her a, a map of this and told her which, you know, all, which, which of these walls where they went and she was able to assemble these in SketchUp. Well, the same way you can assemble the walls of a, um, of a unit like this, you could also assemble the walls of a building. And so one thing we're interested in doing, let me turn on the ground surface back here. One thing we're interested in doing is actually 
rendering some of the buildings on the landscape in this form. So take, you know, scaled uh, either drawings or scaled photos of each of these buildings in the South Yard. For example, the Northeast Slave Quarter do orthographic photos of all, you know, in this case, six faces of this building, the four, you know, north, south, east, and west faces, and then the roof, and then the chimney. Draw that in SketchUp, and then be able to have a model of this in, uh, um, in ArcPro that we could bring in and actually represent these buildings as more than just kind of these, these, these blocks on the ground. So essentially what we'll be able to do is create a 3D environment that then is explorable where you can click on the buildings and bring in, you know, all kinds of information about each of these, each of these structures, you know, whether it's a, an actual um, building from the present day or, or, an, or an archeological site that we've, we've, uh, we've excavated. And I think all these are, yeah, this, this one represents the stable quarter. And in this case, it's representing the stable quarter, the building that's gone. And at the same time, what we've got in Art Pro is representations of the buildings as they're reconstructed. So, you know, really, once you have this stuff digital, the sky's the limit. So we, when DJ was here, he actually brought in all the information for a lot of the buildings across the property, like the, uh, the bowling alley here, the photos of that. Um, we can, uh, you know, bring in uh, just all kinds of information on sites all across the property. And so, for example, everything from, you know, sites that, um, that we've excavated or even just ones that we've surveyed. So this, uh, this is a, a, a cellar hole that we found up in the north woods of Montpelier so here's, um, here's Route 20 right here. Um, the Gilmore Cabin is uh, right here. Uh, these are the, um, the reconstructed huts back in the, uh, back of the Civil War camp. And then we've got a, you know, this building that we found out here that is essentially a cellar hole. This is a shot of, of Cole and Tess back in about 2004 uh, inside this cellar hole. And uh, um, uh, this, uh, this is one of my favorite shots of Montpelier. I don't, I don't know why. Of course, it's because it's of the colon test there. But um, this, you know, it all of a sudden, having this information available, it starts to make these sites real. In fact, we've been working with um, a, a subcommittee of the board, which deals with, um, you know, how to use the property. And by giving them this information, all of a sudden, you know, instead of just looking at the property as, you know, woods and fields, they're able to begin to understand, you know, that there are sites out, out here that have all kinds of potential information, everything from Civil War encampments to um, uh, various, you know, uh, sites that, you know, we've done a lot of investigations on, such as the, uh, as, as the main house. So, um, so some of the other records that we brought into this, um, are uh, you know all the units that we we've, we've excavated? For example, out at the uh, um, out at the field slave quarter, we've got these units here that we brought in from CAD. But right now, we don't have any information attached to it. Like this is unit two one one seven, but there's no data records attached to it. So this is where you know applying for other grants, where we're, where we're able to do what we do with the IMLS and bring the data in, or um, a number of you uh, you know. Dean and Kathy are working on the bunker area and digitizing all the records from the bunker excavations. And so um, this uh, is, let me bring up, I don't think I have these units on. Yeah, these are just the features that are here, but we don't have any data attached yet to these features that were excavated at the bunker. And I, I, I talked about the bunker maybe a month ago, uh, the excavations there. Um, but once, uh, actually, um, uh, uh, we've got someone working on this right now is attaching the data records that you all have digitized to these actual polygons. And we'll have unit summaries pretty soon of all the bunker units that are done. And actually, Kathy and Dean, are, uh, their, their next task that they don't know about is uh, I'm going to have them starting to digitize all the, the stratum records just like um, uh, uh, um, 
Hannah and Taylor have been doing with the seller spaces for the bunker and get some of this baseline information in. So um, that's the, you know, the, the, the project in a nutshell that we're working on. And uh, we've got some weird uh, imagery here with the, uh, the windows uh, floating out in space. Um, and this, this really is that, you know, these windows out here, it really kind of typifies all these things are in layers. And so you can turn them on, on, on or off. This, this is actually from all the second floor. And again, you can just classify this stuff however you want and filter it. Here's all of the second floor that Angie's done with everything complete. But I have one layer that's just the windows, so I can tie that into the, um, the exterior model uh, right here and then turn off the second floor, but still have the windows attached. So again, with a lot of this, we're just beginning to play with it. And um, super excited that, you know, Angie is turning her talents to this to, you know, begin to bring a lot of these, these records in and explore, you know, workflows to begin to do this with a lot of, a lot of other, um, a lot of other uh, buildings and sites we've got on the property. It, what Angie and I are working on next is that this, the program I'm in right now is, um, is Arc Pro, which is, you know, a piece of software that I have on my machine. But I think a lot of you all have seen the web-based maps that um, we've sent to you all. Uh, so, for example, um, the uh, this is a um, uh, a map for um, staff that I've got that has a lot of the same information on it. So, for example, going into the south yard, you know, here's the uh, the northeast uh, northeast quarter, the building, and the archaeological site, and then this ties to like you know the actual excavation records. This is ties to a report right here on the north. North, North dwelling. But right now what we've, you know, what we've mastered is these 2D maps online that are basically a bird's eye view. But what we're, what Angie and I are working on next is to bring this sort of imagery into online software called Scene that would allow you to do this in a 3D format. So, um, uh, uh, we've got a, a, Angie's brought in a few examples of this, but you know, bringing in the whole main house is going to be a little bit of a, a challenge that she's, um, she's working on. And, um, I don't know, are, are you, uh, Angie, if you have your ears on, do you have any insights into, any more insights you've been able to develop on the, bringing this stuff into the online uh, portal? Angie might not be oh and sometimes angie does not have a connection she's able to watch this but not actual actually talk so but um but yeah i've been yammering on for about 30 minutes i'd love to if anybody has any questions or things they want to want to look at yeah matt this is john i had sent you a, a, a questions the lidar that you guys have done, are you going to be able to add that as a layer as well? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, for example, I can bring that in. Um, let's see. Uh, the LIDAR, I'm going to bring this in from not the online version, but from what's on my hard drive. But we have all the LIDAR online. And um, let's see. That is... Oh, I'm trying to remember. I could bring it in from the online version. Tell you, for the online, um, that is right here. So the LIDAR right here, it takes a little bit to come up. I'm going to pull it on, off, on, off the online version, and I'll bring it onto this map. Um, it's coming up here. There it is. Here's the LIDAR. So this is on the online version. And so I can, um, this is actually uh, University of Arkansas where Angie works is where um, I'm pulling this data from. They put this stuff online for us. So I can bring this in, data from path. Let's see if this works. 
And I'm not sure if this is gonna to go to the 2D or the 3D. This, the, um, the, the map you see right here, John, this, uh, this topo map that has the, the shading on it, this is actually from the, the LIDAR data. This is what's called a digital elevation map. And what I need to um, get Angie and the folks from uh, Center for Advanced Spatial Technology at Arkansas to help me with is how to make this into an actual 3D map. So, oh, there, there's a LIDAR, it just came up right now. So right now, um, this, all this, uh, the, um, this DEM right here, this digi digital elevation map right here, it is uh, just, you know, different contour lines that have different color shades attached to them. So this red area, this is the, this ridge line that's behind the main house. So here's the main house. This is this ridge line that's the property line. That's the highest part of the property. And then when you get into the darker green, like in the north woods, these are some of the lower elevations. Um, what we should be able to do is take that digital elevation map and actually make this into a terrain map. You can see it's flat right now, but we should be able to tie, you know, ba basically make this into a, um, a, uh, a 3D map, but then we need to tie the buildings into it with actual elevations, which I think is going to take a little more work. But the LIDAR that you see right here, that we think of as LIDAR right here, this is these, this is this hill shade from the dim that gives you all these shadows that allows all these features to be seen. Like this is in Eastwoods. Here's the, the main house right here. Here's the farm pond, uh, Lewis Hall, archaeology, Lewis Hall in the archaeology lab. These are, the, this is the demonstration forest trail right here. And this is all the Eastwoods in here where we've located, you know, all of these um, uh, various uh, slave quarters, Let's see if I can pick on, yeah, this is the threshing barn that we located out in the woods. Um, but yeah, we, any of the data that we've got, we can bring into this map. Like we can even bring in maps from uh, 1908 um, onto the map as well. So, um, so we, was that your question, John? Yeah, it was. And, and again, it gets back to what you were talking about earlier. I mean, for your interpretive or education staff, you know, they don't even have to pay someone to create educational uh, displays or, you know, items for storyboards or whatever they want to do. They can just use these layers and just get some amazing clarity on the stories they're trying to tell about how the property was used and, and who was on it. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. So, for instance, the, um, for the Eastwoods, we've got a, a story map that uses all this. This is, uh, some, this is a, 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 a story map that's online. And this talks about these hidden sites of labor that are out in the woods. So this is a map of the property. You know, here's the main house right here. Um, uh, you know, the, uh, Lewis Hall over in this area. East Woods is this location right here. And this story map goes into what we did with the metal detector survey, but then also what we did with the LIDAR in terms of figuring out, you know, all of these, um, these ditches and plow, plow scars that we've got out. And you can actually, uh, with this, well, in, in this, you can begin to explore this map yourself, even in the website, which makes it, you know, really, really kind of fun and dynamic. So these story maps, what we're viewing these as is a way, and this is one thing I've got in my, my to-do list is I, I want to um, create some story maps for the IMLS grant that allow basically our tutorial for how to explore the online maps. And then these are kind of like the, the, uh, the gateway drug into GIS is, you know, once you begin to see, you know, you get this text that tells you how to do this, then you can begin to go to these, these maps and begin to explore and turn layers on and off and really start to dive in on all these layers that are here. And then with the IMLS map, it gets even more complicated because, you know, of course, we've got all the excavation unit records that we've got for the cellar spaces and for and under the portico. So yeah, it's uh 
the, the, the thing that gets us the most excited about GIS is just what you're saying, John, this public part of it is like, you know, representing the landscape in a way that instead of just having, you know, for example, with the, um, with the, uh, the trees that we found, you know, if you look at this, these are all these tree holes we excavated. What's in yellow are the actual archeological, um, archeological features that we excavated in the Pinal A. So here's the uh, temple right here, here's the Pinal A. This kind of map, you just don't, don't really understand it. But then when you put in the trees, all of a sudden, you know, you can make the connection, oh, those are the planting holes for these trees. And then, you know, the same for the fence line. You've got um, the fence line that's out here, and here are these individual post holes that we located that allow us to understand where the fence is. So, um, let me see, this is restoration features. And let's go to a, um, one of these that has a post mold. So for example, right here, here's the post mold. And then with the restoration features, there it is right over the post mold. So you can begin to understand, you know, you know, anyone looking at this that's visited Montpelier realizes, oh, that's the front fence that's out there. But then when they start to look at this, they can be like, oh, and that's the actual feature that was excavated. In this case, this is feature 755. We don't have the excavation records attached to it, but to be able to click on that post hole and then actually see the post hole itself, you know, it's, um, I wish we could just do GIS data entry all day long and get all this stuff attached. But, you know, it's something we've got, you know, years and years of the excavation data that we can start bringing in. So for example, this is the grove right here. And with the grove, these are the planting holes that we excavated uh, back in 2018 to figure out where to plant these trees that are actually planted out there today. And these individual trees, we could even have a photo of the tree we, we've replanted out there or a historic photo from the DuPont period of you know, some of these trees that we, we found in the DuPont scrapbook. So just the, the sky's the limit with all this. And you know, like you mentioned, John, the educational aspect of it is what drives this. You know, this there's mounds of data here but then it's curating it in such a way that it makes sense and can tell a story. So all the data in the world, you've got, you know, if you have thousands of records of data and you can't tell a story with it, it's, it's not worth anything. But the minute that you can start to tell stories that relate to how we know what Montpelier looks like, like, you know, you've got this tree here. It's, uh, this is actually, it's a Catalpa tree, but the only model I could find is a chestnut. So this Catalpa tree is from this feature that we, again, we, we, have, we need to get the, the photo digitized of the feature. This is a feature we found in the 2016 excavations of the, of the kitchen. Um, and I think I've got the, um, I've got, yeah, all the um, arc map as well on here. So here's all the, the, the brick, foundation for the kitchen. Um, but we've also got this catalpa tree. We found the, the, uh, the stain in the ground from where it was planted. But there's also, again, there's a 19 set of photos from the 19 aughts that show this tree in place. And actually, I'm gonna uh, geek out here. If we go to base maps and go to the 1908 map, because you might ask, how do you know that was a catalpa map uh, or a catalpa tree? If we go to Mansion Grounds and bring this in, this might take a bit. Yeah, so here's, yeah, the, the, all these, these are, this is the 1908 map just starting to come in. Um, let me turn off some of the units here. Let's see, units main. Yeah, so here's the 1908 map. This, um, this thing that says we can get around here with the tree. Oh, actually, we can just turn the tree off. Let's see, tree turned off. There's 36 inch catalpa. And a 36 inch diameter catalpa, that is a huge tree. That catalpa tree, we know it's there based on this 1908 map. So, you know, there's the, there's the 1908 map. 
here's all the, um, the units that we excavated and the feature, you know, you've got all this data lined up to tell this story about this, about this one tree. So this, um, you know, uh, again, the, the work that we're, our partnership with, with CAST is allowing us to do this in a whole new way. Um, and this, you know, this is just, this is a cool image right here, having the 1908 map with all the trees that here. In a minute here, I'm probably gonna crash our crow. Um, I have not given it a break at all. It, yeah, it doesn't wanna bring the trees up anymore. It said, okay, Matt, you've done too much. But, you know, it's, there's just so much fun you can have with this stuff. Um, but, um, and again, this is, what, what we're excited about this for as well is this kind of um, uh, work that we're doing is work that could be used by other archaeologists, you know, anywhere else. I mean, in terms of there, there are other archaeologists that are doing these kind of these three D renderings of, of, of buildings. There's other archaeologists that have done digital entry of their records, but combining this all in one space, that's where we're really, you know, starting to you know develop a new way of looking at archaeological data. And and again, you know, it's where you can start telling these stories that it gets exciting. I have a question. Yeah, yeah. Um, about the individual units. Uh, did, did you say that at some point uh, we'll be able to look at three, uh, 3D, th uh, 3D models of units so that we'll be able to see, say if we pick, uh, picked a particular unit, we would be able to see the strata within the unit and the, the artifacts and features that uh, may have uh, that that are there. Mm -hmm. um, is is it possible? Sort of looking at units at, at a micro level. Of course, you want to act sort of. Uh, we really want to aggregate all this data together to look at the broader picture. I realize, but on the other hand, it might be at certain times interesting to be able to go into an individual unit mm -hmm. and sort of re-excavate it. Yeah. No, absolutely. That that is um, with what we're what we're doing right now. Like with the the excavations at the overseer's house, we are entering in all the uh, the depths, and we've got this for all the units we've excavated. Um, right now, what is a challenge with Arc Pro is so. In, for instance, if we go to this. Um, I'm going to turn off the main house here. If we go to this unit that I have right here that Angie created this uh, 3D map of, can you see mansion grounds? Um, the portico. Oh, I need to turn off all this stuff. Let's see. The LIDAR and the DEM. So yeah, get into outer space here and then turn off the main house exterior. There we go. So this 3D unit right here, I'm going, to, I'm going to turn off the features as well because they're kind of getting in the way. Um, yeah, so this 3D unit right here, what you know, the, the techniques that Angie's come up with for modeling this work well when it's a flat plane, but creating a complex set of strata, like if it, it like in this case over here, this cut right here is not a flat plane. It is a, uh, um, you know, pretty, a very, what would be a very complex shape across this area. Mm -hmm. That becomes really, in some ways, it, right now it becomes difficult to model in, um, in both, um, both SketchUp, but then also in, especially in, um, in, in Arc Pro and GIS. So I've, there, there are right now are some practical limitations to this beam that I, you know, What's great about Arc Pro and the, and the Esri uh, product line is they're looking to develop more and more capabilities in the 3D environment. So I think as we as we move along, there's going to be more ability for us to do this, you know, in a in a 3D fashion. And so that's what makes collecting the data on all this in a way so that we capture all that information important. So for example. You know, we just played with this a little bit. Like this feature right here, 
this is um, a feature that in 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 uh, in um, that I extruded. I extruded this one in uh, in Arc Pro, but you know, I, I think there's going to be more and more capability of that. But right now, we we don't have the capability to do that because of the limitations of the software. So, so yeah, I'm with but, you. But, but we have the data to do it when the software is ready, right? Yeah, that's the whole whole point. And we we're we're also you know as we um, understand what we want to do with this modeling we're probably going to want to do capture more data. So for instance, with the, the new iPads that have come out, uh, uh, these guys right here, they actually have a feature that's called, that's LiDAR that you can, it allows you, it's meant for, um, for uh, 3D environments, like virtual environments, where uh, for augmented mm -hmm. reality, where you can take your iPad, scan the room you're in, and then you can put objects in there, like for gaming. Well, one thing I'd love to be able to do is to, you know, as we come to the bottom of an excavation strata, is actually scan the strata and have that recorded and then be able to use that a, at a future date. One issue you can realize that probably we're going to have with this is you start to getting into massive amounts of data that you start collecting. And that's where, you know, figuring out those workflows is going to be difficult. For right now, though, you know, with collecting the, um, the we do two things to, to work on it, working on this. One thing is to you know to collect the, the standard you know uh, stratum elevations that we collect in the field. But then what we can also do, we, what we also do it when we're done with each site is we do scans of the um, of the finished product. So I think Megan, you're on here. Megan Ashbrook, she um, uh, helped us with creating, um, uh, hey Megan, she um, helped us on creating some 3D models of some of the excavations that we've done. And that is all in Sketchfab. Um, Sketchfab Montpelier, I'm bringing this up. And you can search this yourself, Sketchfab Montpelier, 3D models for Sketchfab. These are all models that, um, that uh, Megan did for us. And uh, let's see. And this is this is um, Montpelier archaeology. There we go. Oh, it came up. There we go. So the three D kitchen. This is my favorite one of all time. So this is a scan that um, that uh, we that we we did photos of this of the kitchen when we finished the excavations of it. And I think this was in January of 2018. And then Megan assembled this into a, uh, a photogrammetry model of the kitchen that allows you know, some really intricate surface features to be rendered as this, uh, um, as, as this photogrammetry. But what you can do is you can take this photogrammetry here and create a digital elevation model that then you can bring into GIS and then lay that out. And that, that's something that is, you know, not only do we want to take like, for example, this digital elevation model of the 2,700 acres of Montpelier and, you know, render these, render this as a 3D surface and then register all the, um, all the features to it. We could do that, the same thing on a micro level with the kitchen area. And I'll make, Buildings have disappeared. Here they are. Here they are. It just takes, I'm so impatient. They just need to come up. So the kitchen, do to do, it's coming up right now. Uh, where are you, kitchen? It'll come up eventually. The kitchen's right here. We could take the digital elevation. And I think you made a dim of this, Megan. And, and that's, we've got that on the hard drive at Montpelier. We could bring this detailed digital elevation model into, um, into Arc Pro for that. And again, you know, this is one of those things like you're talking about, John, you know, when you look at, um, at this right here, most people can kind of guess that this is a foundation for a building, but you know, and this is in 2D, so not very dynamic, but when you've got this as a scanned model, it's even more dynamic. And uh, Will Rourke, who's on this, on this call as well, Will has done um, uh, terrestrial LIDAR scans 
for almost all of our excavations. And those, um, so for example, with the, um, with the, uh, the Pinal A, that's one of my favorite ones. Um, that one is um, liquor. I'm gonna go down a rabbit hole here. Um, this would be uh, Pine LA. Yeah, Matt, at one of the conferences I was at, um, I saw where they had taken photos like that on the different layers during the excavation. And, okay. then, and then they 3D printed them. And basically like a Lego, you could build the layers up. And so you could have people pull the layers off and basically instantly, you know, in a model form, excavate down through the layers that the archaeologists did. Yeah, that's our friends at Fairfield that did that uh, yeah. down in Gloucester. They're, they are, they've done some really cool stuff with this, these kind of uh, scans. So this is, um, this is a overhead shot that Terry did with the drone. And then this is the, uh, the, the LIDAR, colorized LIDAR scan that, um, that Will did for us. And again, this is basically, instead of doing photographs like we did with, with what Megan worked on, this is with taking LIDAR points that are all colorized based on the LIDAR unit. And so this, they, you know, we've got this in 3D. I don't have, I don't have this on my computer right now because I'm, I don't have it, I'm not at work, at work, I'm at my house, uh, remote working. But this is a 3D model that you can move around as well. And eventually you want to integrate all this stuff into, um, into GIS as a, as a dim. So, but yeah, having what you're talking about, John, is actually, you know, and this is what you started asking about too, Dean, is having every single layer that we've excavated. Um, so for example, what um, Hannah and Taylor have done, each one of these has all the like unit A, or a, a unit 1013, unit A, we've got unit B under there, so on and so forth, have these all be um, modeled. Right now we could do it on flat planes and have them stack up, but the kind of integration you're talking about, John, with like printed 3D layers, that takes scanning it, you know, either through photogrammetry or a terrestrial LIDAR unit, and then creating a digital elevation map, which is essentially, um, like what we've got, um, I showed right here and then, you know, being able to print that or have it be, you know, represented on, uh, in, in a piece of software. So we're, we're, Terry and Mary and I, uh, met with, a, with CAST, with Angie, um, a couple of, uh, about two weeks ago. And we're talking about this, this, just this sort of thing. There's right now there's having a convergence between having all this be in GIS and attached to data and actually showing this, these models in a compelling way is one that, um, you know, we have to make compromises on because 3DS or the, uh, the GIS software is great for the, for the database end and like doing filters and analysis but right now it's not up to speed with say even online software such as SketchUp that allows you to see, you know, all, all this is, there's no data attached to this. This is just a graphic image, a 3D graphic image of the kitchen excavations. Um, but to be able to, you know, eventually have all this mirrored, married together, you know, graphic capability with data where you can actually go in and like, for example, click on each brick like you can in Art Pro, like in here, we can actually literally click on every single brick. And this uh, from ArcMat, this is, you know, the 27,000th, you know, architectural item that's been digitized. And actually, we've got a, um, a uh, one of our, uh, our interns from University of Richmond, Emmy, is digitizing um, the uh, a lot of our arc map right now from the southwest uh, uh, the southwest um, area of excavations here. In fact, this is her. This is Emmy's work right here. Uh, all this stuff she's actually been able to classify by 
you know, the, um, what site, site strata it's in as well. I, I don't know if I have the, um, if I have the, the, uh, all the data um, attached to be brought up on these guys. But again, it just, you know, it's never ending. It's super exciting. But again, it's trying to figure out what we want to do with it and then go from there. It's like when you do a, um, do a presentation in PowerPoint, you know, you might, you know, there's thousands of photos you could use, but until you know what story you want to tell, that's when you begin to refine and make it into, you know, into an actual story. Matt, this is Angie. I just wanted to add on quickly to what you just said. Um, and also quickly apologize. I stepped away for a minute or two and I feel like I may have missed a shout out from you. Um, but my, my son was headed out the door and I wanted to make sure that he was getting to where he was going. And so I, I stepped away for just a second. And, you know, of course, these are the, the trials and tribulations of working from home. But yeah, that's important. Yeah, otherwise, you spend it is. The day it is. Him, so. It's not going to get any easier, I don't think, with the impending school year. But um, we, we do the best that we can. So. Yeah. But um, quickly, I just wanted to say hello to the group. And I wanted to add to what you were saying. Um, ArcGIS is, is very much in the process of moving in this direction of being able to incorporate these more complex models. This software has been around for a long time, at least 20 plus years, and has been 2D up until I'd say about five years ago. Mm -hmm. and so the ability to get these 3D models in is, is still a relatively new feature. And we have to go through a pretty lengthy process of simplification so that we can get these models in and we can get them to stream online and we can get them to, to interact with, with the database. And so it is quickly though becoming um, a place where we can bring in more complex models associated with photogrammetry, with laser scanning, et cetera. Um, but right now, pretty much with what you guys are doing at Montpelier, we are pushing the bounds of that. We are pushing the poly counts and, and what we can stream online and what we can display the use, you know, to the user. And this is something that's really kind of pushing the envelope with this software, um, which makes it a really, really exciting project. And so this is something that's, that's definitely being developed more and uh, is, is there's going to be just more that's going to be possible in the next couple of years with all these different data types. So it's just really something that's just excited to be a part of and to be, to be really pushing this software to expand its capabilities. Yeah, thank you, Angie. I, the, I still am just blown away with what you've been able to bring in with, a, with, a, with this model. Um, this, what the, the model of the house we've had for, uh, it's close to, um, uh, since about 2008 in, in 3DS Max. And whenever I wanted, you know, a certain view of the house, I would have to call uh, either the, the folks down at IATH Institute for Advanced Technology and Humanities at UVA and try to tell them, you know, I need a 30% oblique view of the house. Can you do that? But don't have the walnut tree in the way. And they would send me an image and I'd be like, oh, can you turn it five more degrees? Well, having, having this be in 3DS, in, in Arc Pro, is just a dream come true, Angie, because, you know, we can, you can do a virtual exploration of it. And I can't wait to have this be online. I think it's going to be something that people are really excited for. But you're right, Angie, you're, you're in many ways almost bending light to make this stuff come in. So it's really impressive what you've been able to do. Well, and it takes away that specialized software, that, that 3D development software that was often required before, and it makes it more available to you as the archaeologist, and it also makes it available to the public so that we can share this data. And um, that's, that's something that's just really, really exciting. Yeah, and the, what you, you just said is what I'm, we're really excited about is to be able to, for instance, you know, with the um, workflows that Angie's developing is for us to be able to model these buildings gives us like, it, it allows us to, you know, know how to fish and like start to, you know, experiment with, you know, put, trying different, different buildings on the landscape and 
go from conjecture in our minds to conjecture on an actual landscape that we can see sight lines, we can do view shed analyses, all kinds of things. And it's just really exciting. It's um, something that uh, I've been dreaming about for like about 30 years, but to actually do it, I still get just like a, a kid in a candy store every time I start playing with this, so. Well, and it, it can inform new questions and research directions when you start thinking about this data and being able to explore it in 3D. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, well, I well as soon as um, Angie and I get this stuff online, we're going to shoot this out to you all. So, because so you all can start playing with it. Uh, we're um, uh, just again, this is a lot of this stuff is you know super super cutting edge and. And thank you all for you know not only being interested in this, but for a lot of you all for helping us gather the data, digitize it, and uh, bring it into into this environment. So, um, for the for the lunch and learns, uh, Mary has suggested she, she made a suggestion that uh, or made an offer for her to start do, doing material culture training courses. She's got about five of them that are. She does, she's done with staff for years, and she's gonna, you know, do these for the next couple of, uh, um, of, uh, um, of lunch and learns. And we're gonna mix in other ones as well. We need to get back to Sarah Lee about one that she, she suggested uh, with her and maybe her dad, who knows? So, but again, if anybody has any suggestions for these, you know, that you, things, more things you'd like to learn about on the property, or you know things you've heard us talk about and you want to le learn more about, um, let us know. Everything from funnel analysis to um, you know even uh, um, maybe even hearing from individuals like Megan, what you're up to with your uh, your your three D renderings now, so or, or projects that you've done, Will and Angie, uh, that that would, might be interesting. So, but um, but does anybody have any other questions? Or comments? Yeah, I had a question. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you're planning to bring any of like artifact distribution data into this um, 3D environment so you can see the relationship with the buildings. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that is something we've got the capabilities for right now. Um, and that's basically, you know, for example, with all these units, every one of these units from the database, we've got artifact counts, like ceramic counts, nails counts, bone counts, and we can do distribution maps in GIS to show those kind of, uh, those kind of patterns. In fact, the, the, um, the uh, dashboard that Terry and Chris made for the shovel test fits is an example of that. Um, I don't know if I've got that. Uh, let me see if I can bring that up. I don't have that. Oh, here you go, MDS. No, that's something else. The um, I can, but I'll send you some link. You all some links to this. The um, the, those kind of distribution maps are really one of the more powerful parts of GIS. You can do it in multiple different ways. And yeah, that's we're we're already doing that, Megan. So, well. I just got three texts from Mike Costello, who is setting up a uh, a web um, a web uh, hardware up at up to the site. So he, he's probably looking for some information from me. Um, so I'm going to probably need to jump off the horn. Um, but super glad that so many people showed up for this lunch and learn today. And if anybody has any you know questions or wants to see anything else, you know, drop me an email either. If you don't have my email, drop an email to Dig and Sarah Lee could either answer it or forward it along to me. But um, really, really glad to see everybody today. And um, again, we're we're looking to do some, you know, uh, more of these with uh, Mary doing doing some artifact uh, presentations. But then also, um, uh, if anybody else has any other suggestions, that would be that would be great. So, so, but great seeing everybody. 
And um, we will we'll see you all uh, uh, next week for the one that Mary's doing next Wednesday is on ceramics. So uh, it should be a good one. Don't miss that. You know, excited Mary gets about her ceramics, which is awesome. So, so good seeing everybody. I hope you all have a good week. Bye, everybody.